Good morning, church. Welcome to online worship at Dayton United Methodist Church on this Lord's Day. I'm really glad that you have joined us online, and I hope that you will be touched by God right there where you are today, because his Holy Spirit is not limited to a church building. His Holy Spirit is present wherever there is faith, wherever his people are. I would like to encourage you to take a look at our church webpage if you have not done that, www.daytonumc.org. On that webpage, you'll see a link to a worship resources page. And on the worship resources page, you'll find a note-taking outline sheet that you can print off and use to take notes during the message. You'll find a prayer sheet that will give you this week's prayer concerns. You'll find lyric sheets for all of the songs if you would rather hold them and, and sing along that way instead of looking at the slides over my shoulder. And, and you'll also find a, a connection card button that you can go to and register your attendance and uh, connect with us so that we can connect with you as well. I hope if you are new to our congregation that you will uh, press that button and fill out an online connection card. In addition, on that same page, just to the right of the connection card, there's a button to submit a You Asked For It request. What's that all about? Well, You Asked For It is the summer sermon series, and I take requests, questions that you have, uh, scripture passages you'd like to hear uh, a message about, or topics that you'd like to have explained, and I put those together in a summer sermon series that I call You Asked For It. So you get to help craft the summer by submitting those questions, submitting those scriptures, submitting those topics. And you do that through that button on the wor online worship resources page on the website. So I hope that you will go there, fill out the form, and submit a good question or a good scripture that, we, that will work into that you asked for at summer sermon series. All right, I want to lead us in prayer. And at the end of the prayer, uh, we're going to blow the shofar again today. The shofar is the ram's horn, and it was used to call Israel to battle, but it was also used to call the people to worship in the great assemblies. And so it's going to be our call to worship this morning uh, that we would join in the heavenlies in worshiping God. So please pray with me. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for this opportunity to be together, uh, even across the miles, and unified in spirit as we worship you. God, we pray that you will touch our lives with your presence, with your peace, with your grace, with your joy, and that you will receive our thanksgiving and our worship as we join together today to seek you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We are excited. We have the lovely Betty Adams playing for us this morning. And if you have your hymnals at home, uh, please uh, turn to number 370 for Victory in Jesus to start off with. And you can stand up there in your pajamas there in your living room if you so desire as we worship God this morning. Savior forever. 
As we move toward our prayer time, uh, I'd just like to name some of the requests that we have on our church prayer list this week, and then uh, we'll sing a hymn to uh, open our hearts to God's presence, and then I will lead us in prayer. Uh, Jennifer Ping has been having pain and has gone uh, to Chicago to the Cancer Treatment Centers of America for tests. Please pray for Jennifer. Bonnie Smith has a blood clot in her leg, and she's still tracking down doctors and uh, seeking treatment for that. Uh, we want to pray for those who are furloughed and laid off and unemployed during the pandemic. We want to pray for protection for essential workers and especially for medical workers during the pandemic. And then we want to pray for wisdom for our government officials as they consider uh, relaxing the stay-at-home order and uh, restarting, reopening the economy. We want to uh, have great wisdom to do that in good order. So we want to pray for that as well. Uh, our hymn of prayer hymn is More Love to Thee, O Christ. I invite you to sing and open your heart to God's presence, and then we'll pray together. All right, page number 453 in your hymn, 453.
Please join me in prayer. Father, we would begin by confessing to you that we are not always patient. We get frustrated. We don't like being closed in our homes. And sometimes our hearts cry, why, oh God? Why this pandemic? Why people losing loved ones? Why such illness? And Father, there's no good answer to that question except we live in a fallen world and this is not your kingdom yet. And there is disease and there are genetics and there's a fallen sin nature and this world has troubles and trials in it. And just as the song we just sang, in the midst of all of them, in the midst of all the trials, all the troubles, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of every challenge in our lives, Our heart's cry is, may we have more love for thee. Oh, Christ, more love to thee. Deepen our love. Grow our love. Help us move more and more into the love we have in our hearts for you and to explore greater depths of your love for us even in the midst of the challenges, even in the midst of illness and suffering, even in the midst of being closed in. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Holy Spirit, to have more and more love for Thee. And then as Your love grows in us and as our love for You grows, our hearts will be at rest. We will find the peace that passes all human comprehension. And you will not only bless us with your presence, but you will make us a blessing to others out of that peace, out of that presence, out of that love. You will use our lives to bless others. Father, thank you that we can pray for one another. We lift up our sister Jennifer and we ask that you uh, lessen the pain and help the doctors to uh, see exactly what's going on, whether further treatment is needed. Um, whether any new treatment is needed and that that you would give effectiveness to any treatments that Jennifer receives. Pour out your healing in her life, we pray, oh God. Father, we pray the very same thing for Bonnie Smith. We pray that uh, you will dissolve that blood clot. We pray that you will uh, work through the doctors and through medications or any other treatments, but also, Lord, work beyond them and pour out your healing in Bonnie's life. Lessen the pain. And, uh, Lord, bring her to full health. Uh, God, we pray for those who are being affected by the pandemic and by the stay-at-home order. Some, Lord, including some in my own family, have lost their jobs. Some, Lord, are going into work and working overtime. Some are going into medical facilities and putting their lives on the line and exposing themselves to possible infection. We pray for all of them. We ask you, God, to protect uh, those essential workers who are working so that we can have food and medical treatment and the necessities of life. Uh, Father, we pray for um, those who have lost their jobs or are furloughed from their jobs. We pray that you'll be a God of provision for each of them in their lives. Father, we pray for wisdom for our governmental officials in restarting the economy and and opening up the stay-at-home order so that uh, we can return to some kind of normal life beyond staying in our homes. We pray, God, that that will not mean a huge spike in the coronavirus infections and in deaths, but that, Lord, uh, that you would just cap all of that and, and work against the spread and infection of this disease. 
and help us, Lord, to have wisdom. Help us, Father, to take our own precautions, uh, to wear masks, to uh, wash our hands frequently, to, uh, to limit the exposure so that the spread doesn't go through us and affect someone else. So, Father, in all of it, we pray, may your will be done. In all of it, we pray, God, provide for us, protect us, help us, and help us in the midst of it to be a blessing to others. Help us, Lord, uh, to perform those acts of kindness that can make Jesus real to other people. Father, we pray it all in the name and authority of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Again, this morning, I just want to really give thanks for all of you who are being so generous and so consistent, so faithful in your giving to your church, uh, both the online giving, there's a give, give button, a give button on the website uh, that you can use to give online or by sending checks in the mail to the church. Um, thank you for being part of provision for your church uh, during this time. And uh, we just pray that you'd keep it up as God blesses you. If you, if you still have work, Pray that you would just continue to be generous. Okay, we're going to sing one more song before the message, Trust and Obey. Pastor Eric, please come and lead us. Page number 467 in your hymn. 467.
but to trust and obey. All right, church, I want to invite you to turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're in the second of a three-week series in Galatians 5, and it's, uh, the, the series is Free in Christ. Uh, Paul is dealing with the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, the first week we looked at how we might be confined, but we're free. Uh, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. This week we're looking at being free, but not indulgent. Free, but not indulgent. And then next week we'll go on into the end of the chapter and look about uh, freedom in the Holy Spirit, uh, freedom from the works of the flesh. So um, please join me in, Ro in excuse me, Galatians chapter 5. We're reading verses 13 through 15 this morning. Galatians 5, 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Father, please pour out your Holy Spirit uh, across all the miles in all of our places, in the, in the family rooms and living rooms and kitchens where folks are watching today. And I pray that you would touch our lives with the presence of your spirit so that we hear your word, we understand your word, we receive your word, and Father, we live by your word, the truth of it. And then, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from all sin and death. Deliver us from every addiction. Deliver us that we may be free. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, Fourth of July was coming, and it's not Fourth of July yet, but the Fourth of July was coming, and a preschool teacher was trying to help her class understand freedom and patriotism. And so she told her class, we ought to all be happy that we live in the United States. It's a great thing that we live in the United States because in our country, we are all free. One little boy immediately got up from the back of the class, walked up to the front, put his hands on his hips and said, I am not free. I am four. Well, we might not all be three, but we are all free in Christ. The problem, of course, is that it's a free country can be an excuse to sin. Saying that we are free, our sin nature takes that to an unholy place, takes that to a place where our fallen nature uses freedom as a license for indulgence. And Paul addresses that in verses 13 through 15 in the middle of Galatians chapter 5. So notice, first of all, in verse 13, we are called to be free. We're called to be free. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Free from what? Free from sin, because Jesus died on the cross to pay its penalty and to pay the cost so that we could be forgiven. Free from death, because Jesus came out of the tomb alive and conquered death for us. Free from addictions, because the chains are broken by the grace of God working through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit in our lives. Free from our past. We don't have to be limited by what used to be. We don't have to go back to the past all the time. We are free to live new lives in Jesus Christ. Free from ungodliness. Free to become more and more the image of God that is designed into us so that we become more like Jesus. Free from materialism. Our culture is so caught up in stuff. The one who dies with the most toys wins. But that's not true. And we are free from our lives being defined by stuff when we have freedom in Christ. And in the context of Galatians chapter 5, we looked at this last week, free from uh, slavery to legalism. 
You remember last week we looked at the fact that uh, the Judaizers were calling uh, Gentile Christians to become Jews and, and take circumcision and keep all the law in order to be a Christian. And we're free from the legalism of human effort, the non-gospel of our trying to be good enough, our trying to keep the law in order to earn a spot in heaven. But that does not mean we are free from the law. We are free to keep the law. And that's the big difference. That's the thing Jesus does for us. He, 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 he gives us freedom not to, to disobey the law, not to ignore the law. He gives us freedom to keep the law by the power of his Holy Spirit. We are not free to be unholy. We are free for the first time to be holy. We are not free to indulge our sinful nature. We are free in the Holy Spirit to rather become like Jesus. See, here's our sad reasoning. And we may not think these thoughts uh, consciously, but, but here's what we fall into sometimes in our sin nature. God loves me. There's nothing I could do to make him love me more. There's nothing I could do to make him love me less. God forgives me because Jesus died on the cross for me. God understands that I'm broken and weak, and he gives me grace. And whenever I sin, I receive grace. When I fail, I receive grace. And all of that is true. But where our fallen human nature takes that is to take grace for granted and to believe that it doesn't matter if I sin because I can always get forgiveness. It doesn't matter if I fail because grace will always be there. The implication of the great truth of the gospel that we can live any way we want because we have grace is not God's will. See, Paul speaks to that in verse 13. We take freedom to an unholy place, and Paul names it here. You, are, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Indulgence of the flesh. That's where our sin nature takes this. Living by our appetites. And so the, for all of human history, money, sex, and power have been the great temptations. For all of human history, including today, pleasure, wanting to live by the lusts of our sexual fulfillment, sexual appetites. And don't tell me, as long as we're consenting adults, don't tell me that God has any boundaries for that. If I'm in love, I can, I can commit adultery with whoever I want to. I can... That, that desire for sexual fulfillment running rampant, running unchecked, becomes destructive and sinful. The hunger for power, the hunger for power that, that takes advantage of you in order for me to feel stronger. The, the hunger for power that exercises my freedom no matter what it costs you wreaks great destruction. The longing for wealth the longing for wealth that far too often has caused parents to go to work and pour themselves into their work and short their families and, and, and not love well the spouse and the children that have been given to them, that have blessed their lives. This materialism that, that wants more and more and more stuff, but we're, it, we have freedom in Christ to be free from that. Now, the context of, of Galatians chapter 5 not only includes the Judaizers, Paul was also dealing with another heresy in the early church, another heresy that the Galatians were being bewitched by, and that heresy was Gnosticism with a silent G in the front of it. Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a Greek philosophy. Gnosticism taught spirit is good, matter is evil. It was a duality. Spirit is good, matter is evil. See, the Bible says God created Adam and Eve in a physical body and said it's good. Our bodies are not evil. They're, they're a gift from God. They have fallen. We can use them for evil purposes, but in and of themselves, our bodies are not evil. One of the things that the Gnostics taught is because matter is evil, Jesus could not have taken on a real body, and he only appeared to be a man. He was, 
He was uh, uh, some kind of a phantom that, that appeared to be a human being, but he really wasn't because he had to only be spirit because only spirit is good. And so Gnosticism denied the, the, the full humanity of Jesus Christ. But here's another thing. Gnosticism taught if your spirit gets saved by Jesus and your body doesn't matter because the body is evil and it's going to pass away, then it doesn't matter what you do in the body once you get saved in your soul. And so you were free to live by your desires. You were free to live by your lusts. You're saved by grace, so it's okay to live by your passions. Sound familiar? It's an invitation to allow money, sex, and power, and all of our other wants and desires to run rampant in our lives. Jesus didn't die for us to ignore that stuff. Jesus died to it for us to give us freedom, freedom from that stuff, freedom to live a different kind of life. Freedom in Christ has a different outcome than just returning to sin and asking over and over and over again to be forgiven. Verse 13, we're still stuck on verse 13. There's so much in this verse. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The freedom we have in Christ is not a license to sin. It is rather a calling to serve. A calling to serve. See, we need this fundamental transformation. And the fundamental transformation is from the selfishness of our fallen nature to service. To realize, to have, to have God's spirit finally fully convince our minds and hearts, life is not about me. Life is not even about you. For someone who is in Jesus Christ, life is about serving God and loving others. It's about loving God and serving others. It's both. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. Toward the end of his life, um, there was an, always an annual convention of the army, and uh, General Booth would always speak at the convention. He loved seeing the faces of the thousands of people that came to the convention and who were committed to the work of the army, who were committed to serving the poor and bringing Jesus to people. But in 1910, General Booth's health was failing. As a matter of fact, later in 1911, General Booth would pass on. He was not physically able to attend the convention. Someone suggested that he send a telegram to the convention to, to bring his message uh, to the convention that he always uh, spoke to the convention. He agreed to do that, but he couldn't, he couldn't make a telegram with a 20-minute message. He knew he had to keep it brief, and so he worked, and he got it down to a paragraph, then he got it down to a sentence, because General Booth knew that telegrams charge by the word, and every dollar spent on that telegram was a dollar taken away from helping the poor. And that was not his heart. So he wanted to keep it really short. The convention came, the telegram was delivered, and the moderator at the convention announced that General Booth would not be present physically this year because of his ill health. And a great wave of sadness went over all the whole convention. And then the moderator said, but I have a telegram from General Booth. I'll read it to you. And the telegram said this, one word, others. General Booth, others, one word. That's all he sent. That's all that was needed. Because you see, that one word captures the heart of the Salvation Army. In Christ, we live for others. In Christ, we love others. We don't focus inward, we focus outward. We love others, we serve others, we give to others. This is the call of gospel freedom. To be free to bless others. To be free to show Christ to others. To be free to make a difference for others. In Jesus, we are free to be everything God created us to be. And in his image, we are in the image of the one who loved the world so much that he gave his only son. 
And so in his image, we give our lives, we give our service, we give our love, we give our encouragement, we give our prayers to others. We can't keep them for ourselves. That violates the spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say in the next verse, we're finally going to go to verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law is fulfilled in loving others. General Booth had it right. Love your neighbor as yourself. The bottom line is this. Real freedom is not indulgence. It is serving others in humility. Real freedom is not indulgence. It is serving others in humility. See, the gospel is good news. And the good news is not just meant for us. It's meant for the whole world. And we who know it have an obligation to share it and to help other people know and understand it. What is the gospel? Jesus is a chain breaker and he gives us freedom. Freedom even from addictions. I have a testimony I want to share with you this morning from one of the members of our church. Uh, because of anonymity, and it'll be explained in the testimony itself, uh, he wanted me to read it and not film it. And so here is the testimony of one of our members. I've asked Pastor Mike to read my story because of anonymity. I'm an alcoholic in recovery, and many people don't understand alcoholism or addiction in general. You see, I've sat among you in church many years. I've never been arrested or been in jail. I've never lost a job or been fired for my drinking. But I'm an alcoholic and will always be an alcoholic, now in recovery by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's my story. I feel I had a normal childhood through high school, good parents that made sure I was in church on Sunday. So God was always known to me. Then off to college, and drinking and partying were just normal for the times. My drinking was increasing, but had not affected my grades or graduating on time. Then came my job, and eventually marriage and kids. I continued to drink, mostly staying at home so as not to risk a DUI. As time went on, my drinking increased and was obvious to everyone except me. I was talked to several times by my wife that my drinking was getting out of hand. I'd stop for a day or two, knowing it would slow down, but I would be right back where I left off in a day or two, drinking at the same levels. All this time, I'm still attending church, many times hung over or napping because I felt I was doing the right thing by being in church. Hey, I'm here physically, so I thought that was enough. Then came the day I call my rock bottom. My wife told me one morning that I needed to go to the post office and get some registered mail, her divorce papers from the lawyer. As I went to work that day, I knew deep in my heart that I had a problem. I couldn't stop drinking. The next few days were a blur as I was not drinking. I remember calling Pastor Mike and requesting a meeting. As we started talking, he asked about my past and how I would got to the place where I was. Mike was told about my past and as I feel God wanted me to purge my past and start new. Mike politely stopped me after a time and asked, do you believe in demons? I said, you're the pastor, what do you think? He replied that he believed that addiction opened the door for demons to keep us enslaved. And would I pray with him that the Holy Spirit would come and remove any demon from me? I remember grasping hands together. And as we prayed, I felt something leave my body. I've not had a drink since that day. God had done for me what I could not do for myself. This is not the end of the story. I firmly believe that God led me to a 12-step program, not only to help me maintain my sobriety, but also to tell his story of recovery for me to all those seeking help from addiction. 
As scripture and my program tell me, I must totally surrender to God's will in my life. I start each day when my feet hit the floor, God, today is yours, not mine. Thy will be done, not mine. I remember, remember early in my recovery saying this prayer. Here's the prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with, with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. I believe addiction is addiction, whether it be drugs, alcohol, pornography, or anything that your conscience is calling you to change, God can give you freedom. I never believed I could go one day without a drink, much less nine years. I always knew God. I just greatly underestimated his power. Since that day, nine years ago, life still has its struggles. But when I know God is in control and not me, things get better. I have peace and serenity in my life like I've never known before. People say they have never seen one of God's miracles. <laughs> Look at me. I'm one. If you think you have a problem with alcohol, Pastor Mike knows how to contact me. What God has freely given me, I will pass along to anyone needing help. God's peace to all. Friends, Jesus is a chain breaker. Amen. Jesus delivers us from addictions. Jesus sets us free from the slavery of indulgence. Jesus sets us free from the captivity of our past sins to live a glorious new life and to become more and more and more like him. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that worth pursuing to be more like Jesus? To be free to make God happy by, by living a a life of holiness in love, loving him with our whole heart, loving others as God has loved us and as we love ourselves. I want to lead in, in prayer, and I would just want to ask you to open your heart to the presence of God and to allow Jesus to be your chain breaker. Will you pray with me? Father, every one of us has some addiction in our lives. And part of the addiction is that we don't admit it's addictive. We think we can stop any time. We tell ourselves that we can. Lord, for some of us, the addiction is gossip. For some of us, the addiction is pride. For some of us, the addiction is eating. For some of us, the addiction is pornography. For some of us, the addiction is drugs or alcohol. And I thank you that Jesus Christ is a chain breaker. I thank you that by his death on the cross, sin is forgiven. I thank you by his resurrection, death is broken. And I thank you that by the sending of his Holy Spirit to live in our hearts, we have freedom to be transformed. We have freedom to live a new life. We have freedom. We have freedom, Jesus, to be like you. So today I want to pray for every person listening to my voice, every person joining in this worship service. Set us free. Oh, Lord Jesus, set us free. Yes. Come live in our hearts, Holy Spirit. Break the chains of whatever our past has hold of us. Any addiction, any brokenness, any shame, any guilt, we give it all to you. We lay it at the foot of the cross and we pray, by your grace, forgive change us, make us new. And I pray that, that each one of us would hear the clarion call this morning to live for others, to love others, to serve others. Thank you, God, that not one single act of kindness, not one single act of sacrifice during this time of the pandemic has been unnoticed by you and all of those acts of delivering food and encouraging with a phone call and running an errand, all of the stuff that we've done, Lord, to reach out to others during this stay-at-home order has been appreciated by you. And it's part of our transformation 
to move from selfishness to service in humility. So, Father, change me. Father, fill me with your spirit. Father, make me like Jesus. I pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Closing song is Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's a song that's a prayer asking for the Holy Spirit to fill us and change us. I invite you to join Pastor Eric in singing. Page number 420 in your hymnal. So if God's done something in your life, if, if just now you felt something going on in your heart as we prayed and Jesus is breaking chains, if you'd like to have more prayer, would you please, please, please go to the website to that worship resources page and click on the connection card button and in the prayer request section, uh, tell us about the commitment you've made and, and describe what you'd like for us to pray for. We would love to pray for you by name using that form. So please, I, I would just urge you to do that. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all.